<laughs> Hello, everyone. This is Constance from Mysterious Galaxy. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. This evening, I like it because we have we have two worlds that kind of make up our readership. We have a great fantasy book, and then we have a great sci-fi book. So it is the meeting of the two genres that we absolutely love. And what those two books may be, you might ask, which is a very good question, is on the fantasy side, we have Asperfell by Jamie Thomas. And then on the sci-fi side, we have Wild Sun, which is book two, and it is by Shaquille and Isan Ahmad. And oh, I'm so excited. Both of these sound so great. I'm going to give you just a little taste of both of the books and then I'll pass it off to our authors. But Asper Fell is, oh, it has blood magic, which means dark magic, which just means all of the things that I love as a dark little magical lover. And I feel like um, this line is what like hooked all of the booksellers. Hauntingly beautiful and lavishly told, Asperfell is a must read for fans of Jane Austen who always wished she dabbled in blood magic. And I mean, come on. So essentially our protagonist has to go and find a prince in a dark forest who does not necessarily wish to be rescued. And she's in a very dangerous place that she probably never should have actually been to. But such is how books go and such are how adventures come about. And then Unbound is book two. And I don't I don't want to give away too much because I don't want to spoil anything no. in book one. But it's like science fantasy rebellion awesomeness, which is really vague sounding, but I don't want to give spoilers. Um, but there is uh, this blurb I found that I really liked and I wanted to share it because I thought it was just really, 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 really good. And it says a science fiction saga that ponders themes of colonialism, racial prejudice and gender roles. Cul dot, 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 culminates in a frenetic explosive battle from which no one can escape unscathed, which is just, I mean, come on, how much how much more can you want from a sci-fi novel? It examines humanity while giving you all the good action as well. So on that note, the house rules, the chat is to the right hand side. If you have any questions, make sure to ask our authors. I always think that's the best part of an event. They are at your mercy. You get to ask them questions and pry into their writer minds. And then also too, if you would like to purchase these books, which I highly recommend, then there is a purchase books as well as book plate button down below. And on that note, you took a drink, so I'm not gonna pass it off to you, Jamie, so you can tell people about the delicious cocktail you made in honor of this event. And I will see you guys at the end of the event. Don't forget to ask those questions. Thanks, Thanks Thank you. Thank you. Okay, guys, this oh, is right. a wild fun um, for anyone who wants to make this at home. Uh, I came up with this concoction right after I finished this amazing book, and it is gin and elderflower and blood orange and thyme simple syrup and a bit of pink pepper spice. I thought it was appropriate for our heroine and for um, just the, I love her use of the word frenetic. I feel like that is such a great word for, um, for Wild Sun. And so this frenetic <laughs> energy of the book and the heroine. So um, I will put the recipe on my website, I promise. And then it's never a good uh, sign if someone needs to drink a hard liquor after reading the book. <laughs> yeah, you took so it after, after you talk like. thing, <laughs> Some drink to remember, others drink to forget. <laughs> okay, well, they said no spoilers, but there was, a particular moment that really gutted me, and that's why I needed it. So All right. um, apparently, I can't talk about it, but um, <laughs> you guys are gonna have to pay for my therapy, I think. So we can talk yeah. around it. We can. We can, uh, <laughs> we can talk around ideas. it. For sure. <laughs> oh, good. Okay, guys, I have a question. Can I go first and ask you guys this? Because I'm sure this is on everybody's mind. You guys have collaboratively written two novels. What yeah. is that like? Yeah, um, uh, I'll need a sip of your cocktail. <laughs> yeah, let, me, let me pop a, a bottle of bourbon here and uh, just knock out the word collaborative right, right out. Of here. Oh, okay. Uh, wow, no. You know, we, we get asked that quite a bit, obviously. You know, um, fortunately, we have this common ground of being, uh, I've known Hassan a long time, you know, uh, <laughs> my entire life, exactly, uh, to a T. And so, 
We have a very keen understanding of the world that is like based on just our unique experience. And, and we're very well aware of that. Obviously, there's a larger world at hand that's playing out, playing itself out, just like how, Jamie, you came to tell a story like in, in Asperfell, right? And then why you decided to tell a story like that. Um, there are particular reasons as I do some of the forensics, particularly coming up to launch about why would we tell a story about, you know, um, and some oppressive force colonizing a planet, uh, a fight for natural resources, and all these folks going through some uh, tremendous hardships. But I think at the end of the day, I mean, we were kind of, I uh, didn't really have the uh, freedom to pick the, the topic. The, the topic kind of picked us in a lot of ways, right? It's kind of, it speaks in a, in a microcosm to how we, we look at the world. So Asan and I grew up very kind of in an interesting way, like, just questioning a lot, right? And so, you know, we were we, we came up from a very conservative background. And so we decided that questioning everything as a result of that would be the only way out. So, you know, yeah, I think it was Robert Frost, the only way out is through. And, and so we, yeah. And so we felt, and this is a large part of the collaboration where I, I know I have to stop talking at some point. Uh, and we, <laughs> I'm going to pass it to Hassan. Uh, but we found that telling, uh, putting our characters in particular through a lot of uh, uh, just a huge uphill battle was incredibly necessary because it is perhaps just similarly to us, we felt like underdogs in a way too. Uh, so I'm gonna, with that, I'll kind of pass it off to Hassan to give him a, a few minutes on it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, it's, I think you're hitting on some of the key things there. I mean, it's um, really, it's just, God, there, there's so many sort of angles to that. I mean, yeah, I, definitely the way we were raised uh, had a, played a key role in sort of the themes that we chose. Um, but in terms of like process of engaging with each other on those ideas. So it's like it's one thing to personally experience and go through that in your life um, and, and to sort of have your own understanding of how to express that artistically. And it's a whole other thing to, to have, do that with another person and then marry those two ideas and thought processes and then like bring something to bear that is a, you know, a creative collaboration or, or basically create something that is a, a, a product of both those lines of thought and, and independent, like individual um, experiences. So uh, it, in one way, it was like, you know, we had this shared childhood that we began with, like into our early 20s. Um, and then we sort of all like, you know, I guess as um, wayward sons are want to do is that we kind of all sort of branched out and went off in search of our own sort of identities and things and like um, yeah. only like coming together like you know not even necessarily at the holidays but like we had always shared um, you know vibes on music on on art that we liked films that we liked we grew up watching similar films so those those things carried with us into our own res respective journeys um, so when we came together again to say um, you know, in our, our late twenties, early thirties, to start creatively collaborating, we just had this like foundation and, and communication um, wavelength that we um, that just existed that we could just tap into almost almost immediately. Um, so we didn't have a way, have to use up a lot of time like trying to probe around where the other person is coming from. Um, uh, <laughs> what's that? I said that must have been a relief, though. Oh, like, yeah. Um, like, oh, creative yeah. tension is, uh, is so difficult. I don't know. Have you ever tried to collaborate with anyone, uh, Jamie, on, on a, like, a, like a project? Not on my writing, no. Um, yeah. yeah. No, I always, I'm, I'm very... Uh, Except for uh, J J Jim, Johnny, Glenn, you know what I mean? <laughs> Those are your collaborative partners. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice, yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> Wine usually when I'm writing, oh, but yeah. um, yeah, yeah. No, I, I have to wonder what happens when you guys disagree on a major plot. Like, how do you resolve disagreements? Not just in your drafting, in your uh, and in your initial draft process, but in your revisions, in your editing. Have you guys ever ended up in a situation where you have butted heads or disagreed about the way that something should go in the book, and how do you resolve that? Yeah, yeah quite I mean, to the death, basically. I mean, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. I'm wondering your brother. So, is it like wrestling? Is it like you know, yeah, exactly? <laughs> uh, here, here uh, to to answer it uh, directly, there's two things in particular that I have found. And son, will probably agree. There's a tremendous amount, and we think of things uh, highly visually 
so in terms of like uh, filmmaking in a lot of ways, right? So a lot of pre-production, a lot of pre-production, mm -hmm. and, and then a lot of conversation or understanding of taste. And, and so that's, yeah. Yeah, right. That's uh, and we can unpack those. Uh, but the way that we resolve a lot of the things is it are, is the issue at hand in the, in the service of what all that work we put in, in pre-production. So Asan and I love to do this whole bird's eye view, 15,000 feet, depending on, you know, the drink or the animal, uh, you know, something <laughs> higher than that. Right. And then we'll, we'll just love to live in the clouds. Right. And, and think about how the story can possibly go. We're, huge fans of like a through line. It is like paramount to us to connect one dot, however, you know, uh, complex to another dot uh, that you might never have imagined, right? So it's, it's very important. And now and then more basic things. So a lot of pre-production just gets us through a lot of the slog of when we come up into the technical writing aspect of it, because like, you know, we're actually servicing the, we agree, something we already agreed upon, right? right? It was like a, a founding document, if you will. And then secondly, and again, I will pass this on to you, Asana Sec. Uh, the, the taste aspect of it is that we, we got into this as first time authors in particular, um, because we found that a lot of the time that our taste what, didn't match up to a lot of our, ex, um, a lot of things we were seeing or reading, right? Or our mm -hmm. expectations. Uh, and taste is subjective, of course. Um, yeah. So um, I think that's one of the most satisfying things I, I experienced uh, throughout the writing process was to see certain elements of the, of the book come together and satisfy my inner taste. It is like yeah. so gratifying. I would, the second would be the opposite end of that is like, uh, I would, the people's reaction to it as you, mm -hmm. you know, what I mean? like I'm sure you, you as well probably have yeah. felt that. Um, and then uh, I'll kind of lead it, uh, kind of pass it off to you, Son, and then perhaps Jamie, actually, uh, maybe you could answer the, the same question in terms of how you get through things um, individually, of course. Yeah. <laughs> it's not, go ahead. You go first. Uh, yeah. Um, I mean, you hit, you hit on sort of the, the key point as this usual um it's prioritizing alignment up front is just critical in sort of most creative collaborations that's not to say that there isn't a little bit of jazz that we play as we go through it and um we're just able to quash uh creative tension pretty quickly because there's a bit of charity we we give to the other person um intellectual charity emotional charity we're like we know it's coming from a good place um yeah and we try to like leave our egos at the door um, which is hard to do for like competitive brothers, you know, where we're yeah. always kind of looking yeah, at how to more creative and uh, intelligent than Hassan, so it's right, always right. difficult. Yeah, he looks oh, yeah. the limelight a lot more, as evidenced by the amount of time he spent talking thus far. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, like I, I think um, you 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 were talking about earlier is just like you know how are we able to the the level of taste that we we have right? So uh, we understand that. Purely subjective, and, and anyone, you know, it's not us like sticking our nose up at, at sort of any other creative endeavors. Right. It's just that we have our own taste that's been uh, that's been a result of our, you know, our, our collective artistic, um, whatever we've imbibed artistically. Um, yeah. So we know that the other, uh, the level or the quality of our ideas when presented to the other has to be of a certain quality standard. I, I know that sounds kind of like militaristic, I guess, a bit, but it's not, it's not, it, believe me, the execution of that looks nothing, it's not necessarily organized, it's very, it's an abstract thing, but it's just the thing that we have sort of in the back of our heads when we start to yeah. talk about structure and plot, where we want, where we see a character going, where we see, you know, when we get into individual scenes down to like words and sentences and paragraphs, um, right. the good news is that like we don't really get hung up on a lot of that stuff, otherwise how the hell, if you argued over every sentence in the that's what I was wondering. Gosh, how do yeah. you make that happen on that kind of a level? Like, yeah. I want this character to go this direction. I want them to go this direction. I'm wondering if there are moments, as I was reading Wild Sun, I was like, I wonder if this was a Shaquille moment or if this was an oh, Isan yeah. moment. Or if this was my idea versus a, a single author where it's all one yeah. idea. So you kind of wonder, I, I just sat there the whole time, like, I wonder who made this decision or who made that decision. It, um, I don't think I've ever considered that in reading a book before because I don't I don't think I've met uh, read, read many collaborative works before. 
Mm -hmm. So in considering it, thinking, okay, there are two writers and two minds writing this, it did change the way I approached it a little bit, but in a really good way. Um, yeah. Weird thing to have in the back of my mind while I'm reading yeah. it, but again, you've though, certainly experienced it, though, Jamie. Right? It, you've seen a few films by meaning, like uh, let's say uh, the Cohen brothers, or again, I'm not comparing ourselves to these people. Uh, yeah, uh, what's, the, the Wachowski, the Wachowski sisters, right now. Love um, the Wachowski sisters, and yeah. um, the Co or like the Russo brothers, even. So yeah, I've seen Russo. it, but I haven't experienced it in the format that I created. So of course yeah, I'm approaching sure. it as a writer, as a singular writer going, how right. would I do this with another person? And so immediately when I knew we were gonna talk, I was like, that is gonna be the first thing I'm gonna ask them is just, uh, because I'm sitting here in my own little, you know, whatever, like he he, I'm making all these decisions. And <laughs> well, I mean, I have to, then I got Rick after that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We all got Rick well, after Rick's, that. Yeah, Rick's amazing. <laughs> Rick's, by the way, shout out to, to Rick at Upwork. Oh, an amazing so, publisher. I, him early on i'm in the middle of the big revisions for the sequel to asperfell and oh, um yeah. or not um, <laughs> <laughs> this is an interesting uh, time where i am taking this large chunk of this book and i'm cutting it up into these little pieces and we're doing a lot of rearranging which yeah. isn't something that I'm, I'm used to but i warned him when i gave him the draft and was like listen <laughs> there's like a large chunk of this that yeah. um, but I just wondered how different that was when I, I certainly bounce ideas off of people. Like my husband usually gets the brunt of that. Um, usually when, you know, and I yeah. trust his instincts, but for the most part, it's me making those decisions. So I had to wonder just like these major character things. It was like, was that one, one of you bringing it to the table and then the other agreeing, or is this just this, because you guys have this shared history and, and, mm -hmm know each other's minds so well if it was just a, a just collaboration through and through or if there are ever moments where one of you won over the other and yeah just had to wonder about that yeah well let me answer that like, it's, 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 you're gonna ask me i've forgotten now yeah <laughs> the, all up in that i'm sorry <laughs> no the, the the genesis of the of the wild son was really a son um and, and all credit to him we were actually um, we tell the story writing a screenplay that we, we, we love, like we love film in, per in particular. I can, I can get it. Well, Ronald's son read so much like a movie to me. Oh, very cool. Yeah. 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 Visual and, um, pacing. Oh my God. And I come back to that word frenetic again, but, um, yeah. just the pacing that there wasn't a moment where it, it just like, okay, it's that settle moment. It felt like I had to just like, Adrenaline up the whole time. Um, yeah, yeah. That's, it's that's very good. much like a movie to me. I'm just like, oh, I can see this. This is happening right now. So yeah. similar, similarly yeah. uh, to you, Jamie, with Asperfell, I know in the, the earlier parts of it, there was a lot of like world building, right? And, and and we and we and we appreciate that so much because it's very important to set up. Uh, obviously, understand the world, but. Uh, furthermore, understand motivations and character motivations, because a large part of what we wanted Wild Sun to be, and this gets back to the taste conversation, yeah. is that it's not really, we could call it like epic sci-fi, but when you really look at it, you're following uh, three characters, yes. you know, intimately uh, through uh, all manner of experiences, some very, uh, very relatable. Very intimate journeys, too, for especially oh. one character yeah. in particular, for me. Yeah. And no, no, exactly, exactly. And so um, it, that was important. And the science fiction, we always say, isn't the lasers and spaceships, it's more, it's a light dusting, right? Uh, a light dusting. The, yeah, <laughs> the rest is like, what is our universal experiences, I find. So you could replace the the genre. You could, it, to be honest, you could do this in, in, in 17th century England or something like this and tell similar stories about people uh, against um, uh, tyranny or, you know, oppressive forces or uh, inner inner journeys about, um, you know, who they are and, and, and really, and then we get larger into existential questions. Now, a lot of this ties back generally to very human affairs, right? Because it's like, uh, we, we deal with like these larger themes. And I, I, I just think that science fiction is one of the best the best kind of vehicles um, 
for talking about, particularly now more than ever, with everything that's going on, right? Because you have Elon Musk recently talking about colonizing not just Mars, but the galaxy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> They're very real things. And, um, but I know, I know, I know I've been talking for a bit. How about Hassan, if you want to chime in? I know we have questions too. I, I didn't want to like not. Yeah, miss we can, we can. Exactly. It's so great. You guys are talking about, um, and I don't know, Rick, please don't hate me if I'm not supposed to talk about this, but um, colonialization is obviously a huge um, theme in Wild Sun. Yeah, I don't yeah. forget about Unbound because like everybody, I just got my copy this morning. Um, yeah. But it actually is a huge theme in my second novel. So it looks like it's mm. on a lot of people's minds right now. <laughs> yeah. I don't think I be specific about it because I think it would be too much of a of a spoiler. Um, but wait, what question we were going to ask Hassan? Because I have like a gazillion questions for you guys. I have to slow. Yeah, down. no, I wanted to make make sure Hassan had an opportunity, to kind of like to talk about the, along the lines that I I was. If you wanted to jump it, in, yeah, it. It, it's been a while. So what was the, that question you were responding to? Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> that perfect vehicle yeah. is it such a a great way to yes. have a yeah. metaphor about human condition and human emotion, even though we're thinking, oh, it's technology. It's not just exactly. that. Exactly. No. Uh, yeah, no, totally. And and I guess we were talking about, you know, the, the aspect of the fact that it translates to, to film or very much kind of structured or looks like a film in yeah. terms of sort of set action it's pieces there. of sequences in particular. Um, and that that's not, that's, I can't say that's not deliberate. Um, what we wanted to do really was make it so that, um, there was this pacing to it that felt gripping and you could you, you wanted to engage with the characters uh but what we find is that in cert in the genre sometimes it's like it very much veers into that direction and yeah. sort of doesn't really do service or justice to the characters and sort of their real arcs for them action so we just commit to ourselves that if we're going to put action into the into the story uh, or when there is action in the story that it has to serve the character and it has to have meaning for the story um, yeah. And I think that's where we were able to find, or we felt like we found the right balance. Um, mm -hmm. It wasn't just action for the sake of it, and it wasn't just sci-fi for the sake of it. None of that really, you know, um, like you said, Shaquille used the word of, you know, the phrase of light dusting. I almost look at it like sci-fi was sort of the medium which we, which we told because, you know, that we told the story because sci-fi lends itself to um, just really wax on like current day real world situations and scenarios. Um, it, and, and be free to do that. Whereas if you were telling, you know, if you were writing a column in the New York Times or, in, you know, in a, in a publication, you'd have to be very grounded in fact and all those yeah. other things. Whereas yeah. here we can take some sort of liberties um, and just by virtue of flexing that way, um, we were able yeah. to kind of um, just, we, we weren't tethered to sort of whatever. Uh, yeah, we were just weren't tethered or didn't feel tethered as we were writing yeah. it. Um, so yeah, but um, yeah, I mean, just, it, 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 yeah, go ahead. I teach my students. Um, I'm a middle school English teacher, for those who don't know. That's oh. my day job. Um, <laughs> oh, that actually is a drink. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, my gosh. I might. teach um, <laughs> universal students a lot, particularly with my seventh and eighth graders right now. And I find that fantasy and sci fi mm. are, because you're mentioning Tether, those places where we can uh, explore a lot of those themes. Yeah. Um, and set them almost anywhere. Like the, the themes that are in both Asperfell and in Wild Sun could be set in 16th century India. It could be set in, uh, you know, 500 years in the future. It could be set any of this because these themes are so universal. And um, I often, I find though that with fantasy and sci-fi, because you can bend the rules, um, it, it eliminates um, some of the, like you said, tethers that you might have to adhere to if you were writing a contemporary lit fiction or um, specific historical, you know, stuff. You can pull from so many different, um, you know, genres and tropes and things like that, which is why I think it's funny because people view science and fantasy as, oh, it's just wizards and spaceships and all this yeah, stuff. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's not. Actually, I think you will find um, like, gosh, I would ask anybody who says that to, to say, have you ever read Ursula Le Guin? You know, or, or, or something. Uh, yeah. I mean, really, yeah. Yeah. even back then, it's just, it, these themes are so universal. And I like the way that we are freer almost than other genres in our uh, ability to play with those themes. Um, if that makes sense at all. Yeah, uh, that makes sense. Uh, fancy. I, I, um, 
you guys, of course, because you love sci-fi. Do you, did you watch the reimagined Battlestar Galactica? Please tell me you did. Uh, the most recent what? version. No, you didn't. Um, yeah, I did. Yeah. Because everybody would say, oh, I don't want to watch it. It's sci-fi. It's not. It happens to yeah. be human stories set in space. It's political intrigue, yeah. It was the setting for mm -hmm. this political and, and human drama. And so that, that's kind of how I saw Wild Sun was, okay, this could have been set anywhere. These themes, though, of the colonialization, of that mm -hmm. uh, tenacity uh, to survive, um, mm -hmm. the racial aspects, even, yeah. you know, animal cruelty, uh, you could practically set them anywhere and it would still be just as effective. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. And they had challenges with, uh, they had challenges with Battlestar Galactica and that it, it's funny that you say that because it's like they relayed all that, all that political intrigue, all the character yeah. drama, the relationship drama, the leadership aspects, colonialization, you know, um, <laughs> genocide, all, all these really yeah. deep, deep themes. Um, and then the sci-fi aspect with the Cylons is that they, they wrote themselves in a bit of a corner and they didn't know how to resolve it. it it's just funny that like that much attention wasn't given to the sci-fi aspect of the whole thing. Um, so oh, I don't know if we're doing them credit. We're, we're kind of saying that that's actually a good thing that they couldn't figure that out. Um, but they just didn't wrap that up at, by the end of the series. But uh, great, just a great show. Yeah. I, <laughs> I just want to. I see a few questions here. I just want to yeah, make sure I get into it. Those, yeah. uh, so the first question was: Do we think magic and science technology hold the same role in novels of allowing humans to do things they currently are unable to do? All, so you, things you, that we write in our book. Yeah, you, you know, fuck the entire hierarchy of this question. There's a vote system, and you can vote for the question that you want. Oh dear. <laughs> I think well, you guys up was the uh, well. We could answer that question, uh, but also you got one, Jamie, about the opera influenced Asper fell in any oh. way will influence in future books. Um, gosh, you know, <laughs> will we get any books set in an opera? <laughs> that guy you you got to answer. You got to answer it. The crowd is moving. <laughs> this is a democracy. Oh uh, my god. I yeah. don't know. Um, before I was a writer and a teacher, um, I have a master's degree in vocal performance from the San Francisco Conservatory of Music. Uh, I, oh. I am a true opera singer. I have not sung, though, in a very, very, very long time. This was a circuit. Um, so everyone, this time. Uh, and you got a cocktail in here. I did an article for Women Writers Magazine a few years ago about, because um, they asked me to compare uh, my studies as a vocalist to um, Asper fell into what I was writing. And for those of you, I'm sure it's not a spoiler at this point, the book's been out for a year to know that Bryony's unique talent is voice, speaking, communication. She's an orator, orator from the old tongue to speak. Um, and definitely while I would say that that aspect might uh, come into play a little bit, um, I think the confusion is that for me, it was more um, the use of the voice politically and uh, to help others and to give a voice to those who either have never had one or who have lost theirs and, um, you know, mm. need to regain that. Um, I don't know if my actual musical or operatic background will ever come to play in any of, of my, my future projects. Um, it's a very strange thing um, to have that, that large part of my life that I, I don't do a lot with anymore. Um, but that's a great question. Uh, yeah. Who know is the answer? I'm not sure. And I now I need to ask which one of it of you guys is the musician here. Yeah, uh, well, I am also an operatic. Because I heard one was a bassist for a band. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, well, no, it it's not this guy right here. I think I'm pointing to him. I think he <laughs> means when 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 if we get drunk, who sings Frank Sinatra? And uh, I think that's. Yeah. Yeah. that's oh, I'll you. take that. <laughs> Shaquille, who sings Frank Sinatra? Which one? Uh, that would be me on the Sinatra, a drunk Sinatra for sure. Uh, oh, as any good Pakistani boy, you know, would do. Uh, but no, Hassan, um, I think that it, it touches on why Hassan's an easy collaborator for me. This is my first time doing a like a creative collaboration in a in a in a true sense, right? Organized creative collaboration. Right. Oh, yeah. Uh, Hassan's been through the rigmarole of trying to um like 
uh, I don't know, tease this out. I'll let you speak to, you know, kind of the, the, the music creation and, and, and all that other stuff, you know, oh, if you want sure. to. Yeah. Yeah. So I was in an, in an indie rock band, uh, for, for many years in my teens. So, you know, just trying to sell my note. Yeah. Uh, all kinds of, you know, um, all that teen angst I had saved for my, my twenties. Um, so just, it's funny because I was like right out of school and, um, uh, right out of college, I should say. Um, and just, you know, get, go right into the corporate world and just had all of this kind of like, you know, when you talk about rebellion and sort of revulsion and, and pushing against sort of systems and authorities and things like that. So I, I couldn't help but have that sort of vein, but. Which doesn't um, happen any, anymore in, in the United States, right? No. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Were you in college in New York, Esan? Were you in New York at the time? Uh, I was not. So I was at the time in uh, South I guess Philadelphia. So oh. yeah, I, yeah, um, I yeah, I, I lived and worked in in, in and around Philadelphia, nice. um, and South Jersey, so, Southern New Jersey. Oh, um, Jersey, <laughs> Jersey. Um, yeah, oddly enough, and I'll get back to this, but I think someone who's watching this show, uh, watching this live broadcast, will be upset at the fact that I've never watched The Sopranos. And he like literally every time I see him, he's like, "You didn't watch The Sopranos? It's like the greatest TV show ever. You can't believe it. You're from Jersey. You lived in Jersey. You should watch." Never it. seen it either. So, Jonathan, either. if you're out there, all right, there we go. <laughs> both too of young. Us, we we none of us have watched The Sopranos. What's that? When did it air? I feel like I was too young for it, but I don't know. Maybe I wasn't. And it's time. It's now it's time. Um, but I'm, yeah, so. We were in, um, yeah. So it was, you know, started writing uh, music. I, I, I had a friend of mine at w where I worked who was, like played guitar, and he was just an amazing singer and guitarist. I mean, I was in awe of this guy. Um, we were just great friends, and we were both kind of going through this angsty period in our lives. Um, so, it, 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 I mean, I, I'm, I'm kind of calling it angst, but really, it was just an urge to do something different to create that we weren't necessarily fulfilling otherwise. So. Um, yeah, we basically turned into what's affectionately called as weekend warriors, uh, where you're like, you know, basically doing shows on the weekends and lugging gear and drum sets and, and all that stuff, right? Like, um, to play for like two people on this, that are sitting there in Philadelphia bars. Um, and we worked our way up to like a decent, a decent music scene. Um, but I think the collaborative aspect of that was, you know, we were, we wrote and recorded, uh, three albums a work of music and I wrote a lot of lyrics and things like that. Um, but it was cool because it's like, it's really intense because in that way, so, you know, the lead singer and I were very much like kind of simpatico, but you realize it's like, you spend all this time writing a song or writing a lick or let's say you come up with something and you want to share it with someone and you share it. And it's like their subjective experience of that can be vastly, vastly different than yours when you thought, thought of it. So it's like, you know, maybe they don't like it or they don't gravitate towards it. And it's like, doesn't become a song. And it's like, you're like, damn, I, I love that lick. I want to keep that lick. And you kind of have to find that balance. Um, so it's like, you have to get over that rejection, that ego piece of it, if you want in service of creating something together, if you truly want to do that. Um, so it was just kind of finding that, or finding that ability. I, I look at it as like a bit of a skill set to say, um, yeah. no, you know, awesome. I'm going to let the, I'm going to let the best ideas lead here. Um, and be willing to, to to let someone else have that best idea, and even though it doesn't come from me, uh, because we're both creating this together. So, like I said, it's a shared identity on a creative project um, is is challenging. But um, yeah, like I said, I, I I've, I've had years of doing that in the music realm. Um, so when we got together and we wanted to work together, um, it just made it, it was easy for me to do that because I, I was already able to. Now that I've heard this story, just that you guys yeah. work so that way you've had so much experience in that way so yeah, this I mean, your first novel both of you have you guys haven't written anything before nothing um, uh, Shaquille wrote some light erotica I believe early in the in the uh, where do we find <laughs> that online <laughs> well you uh, could find my ex-girl right <laughs> well, that's where we'll find that <laughs> Jeez. Oh, this is it. Yeah. Oh, my, I hope my mom's not on this. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> I did a radio interview once um, up in uh, a station in Canada, and he got all um, 
Amazon Canada. And I don't know why, because it's not, but they had classified Asperfell as a romance. And so oh. what we did is we looked at all the covers of shirtless men that were normal, <laughs> my gothic fantasy <laughs> to see yeah. like all these things. Yeah. That interview quickly like devolved. Um, yeah. so a much good fun. Interview, yeah. um, I don't know why they classified it as that because it 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 has romantic aspects, but it it definitely. Although, well, that's not. I don't know. I lean into it a little bit more heavily in book two, um, like maybe some scenes that I'm embarrassed that my mother will read. Oh, yeah. really? That's, yeah, I that's, was wondering about that. Only, yeah. only, well, uh, I don't know. Okay, so book three, I, I told my agent that straight up there there will be some stuff in there that I don't want my parents to to just, you know, like maybe if you're going to read it, just don't tell me. So I don't yeah. have to look in my head. But, so that's been a bit of a challenge just because as Bryony has grown, um, mm. you know, that that becomes an actual projection of a human being and or yeah it makes it makes a lot of sense yeah. it's funny, well, it's we funny also, what was is because you follow bryony from a young from yes. a young girl right so like that would be also interesting to know like you knew this person as a younger person and then yes. in, in and then now she's 2021 about oh. about um oh and that is another beef i have that i just have to air is that um Apple gets shelved a lot as a young adult novel, but it's so funny because a review the other day was like, man, Elian is a really old dude for a young adult novel for a love interest, you know, at almost 30. I'm like, it's not young adult. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the of that main cast, but I think because Bryony is 20, 21 around, it gets shelved as a young adult, but I'm like, Sh most of the cast is well over that age, but maybe right. it starts out so young at eight and then yeah. 10 and then finally at 20 um that you kind of lose sight of the fact that you know by the time she gets there it's like no no, no she's well beyond that point but um you know and so there's always that nervousness that as as she grows and the novels grow in terms of her awareness and her maturation and, and all this just that it it is going to be a little different i think from from book one to book three so i have to ask Yours is a trilogy, yes. You've got a book three that's going to be coming. Yeah, yeah. You know. Now then. Are we writing it now? I mean, yeah. is Rick still on the call? Uh, <laughs> 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 like, um, you guys, guys, 20 more minutes and then you get back. Yeah, 20 to more minutes and I need you back writing. <laughs> uh, yeah, writing yeah, last night for like midnight. Yeah. See, I'm so good. It was <laughs> I was working last night. <laughs> You know, we, we always imagined it as a trilogy. And um, also, just to go back to Dana, uh, Dana Kay's uh, uh, comment from earlier, I'd be curious how a director would depict the world. Uh, I just want to say, I, I too, Dana, would be curious if a director would pick this up. <laughs> and I'd love to see what they could do with it uh, as well. You, would you rather see it as a movie or a television series or a mini series? What do you think, what, what kind of visual medium would serve the book the best in your opinion? Um, and turn, and I, can, I would say TV series for me, a, a serialized content. I just think that yeah. the reason I say that is just because, not to say it's obviously possible to do this in film, um, so total caveat there, but I just think that the more time you can spend with a character, the more that bond can be created. And I mean, some of the best characters that you know live with me now to this day, it's just like we're told through seasons and episodes and things like that. And I think you can explore themes a little more deeply because you just have more time to do it. Yes. Um, and, and that's not to say that you can't make poignant statements or character can't leave an indelible mark, you know, in, in an hour, yeah. you know, a couple of hours or more. Um, but obviously I'd love the opportunity to kind of expand on that and, and the universe that we create. I mean, Wild Sun, of course, stands alone on its own or, or the, the series we're telling here or the trilogy that we're telling here stands on its own. Um, but we've created a whole universe around this. So it's like Wild Sun is a bit of a like small piece of this larger world and universe that we've built that I think would lend itself to kind of that kind of expansion. And, and um, But yeah, I mean, I don't know, Shakil, what do you think? What, what would you be interested in? Performative dance? Um, I'm going right for it, man. It's got to be a movie through and through. You know what I mean? Uh, in terms of serialized content, et cetera, I, I find it dilutes. Uh, it, it has a tendency to, to dilute things, right? So it stretches. So if you were to look, imagine an arc, right? If you were to imagine like a bell curve of sorts, uh, what you can do with a movie, I find you can find a higher apex of the arc 
Whereas with a serialized content, you have to stretch that same oh, amount that you have to go across. So it flattens the arc a little bit. Uh, and it's not as impactful. Um, and I just think movies uh, in, or film as a, as a medium are just, um, there's more opportunity to like get, oh, hey, Sans, Sans, here we are. I'm not doing, I'm not doing Oh <laughs> my God. You're Martin Scorsese over here. Go write an op ed. Go write an op ed. In uh, New York yeah, Times right. About okay. how Phil, you know, like, you know, okay. the Avengers have killed everything and, you know, like. <laughs> Yeah, by the way, I'm willing to say it. I'm willing to say it. Uh, yeah, Don't do it. Don't do it. But the Marvel movies have ruined <laughs> <laughs> no, Let me, oh let me clarify God. this. I'm just kidding. What what it is is that what Marvel movies have done, they're a symptom of something different, right? And, mm -hmm. and again, if we get philosophical about it, it's us moving in more into a secular, secular society. So for the longest time, we've had religion in terms of um, telling um, kind of more, um, how do we say, it? epistemological understanding of the world or, or, or understanding of truth, right? Uh, and then secondarily, uh, heroes' journeys. And Marvel, Marvel right takes, <laughs> yeah, Marvel takes the hero's journey and gives us symbols of that. So when I look at that, I think that's wonderful. I think it's incredibly important, particularly as um, we start to crack at the foundation of truth. Whether, whether that's good or not, I think our access to human understanding and knowledge of things is, you know, is just vast by, by virtue of having smartphones and access to it all. Yeah. But for some reason, we seem to understand each other less, which is interesting. And Marvel, Marvel movies are an opportunity to come to one synonym of truth from time to time. So I am willing to give that. If this, that this is just a, a this is how he says he doesn't like the dark knight this is basically this is a preamble to I'm like you know. pleasure was a great joker and then he's like well if you think about humanity and truth it's like i don't oh know about God. if i enjoyed those that those three hours uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway I, no. I just love that i love yeah. that are you a nolan batman fan then do you guys is this is this your guys's big clash right here is is the dark knight i have to know it's been one of it's been one of our bigger bigger classes. the dark knight was one in particular um uh, because obviously like heath Led heath ledger did a great job it's a good it's a it's a nice um superhero uh superhero <laughs> drama it's a nice superhero drama, but when you talk about some of the more granular aspects of the human psyche and what you can do with it, yeah, you mentioned the word, the idea of like particular tropes, right? And there are certain things that these movies have to carry in to pay service to the comics that are highly unnecessary to to the story itself. So well, I, I think, think we can agree. There's some. There's some. Like, okay, so you're talking about superhero genre, and there's some some tellings of it. Like I, I thought. Um, Logan was a great telling of a uh, superhero, yeah. you know, I mean, a, a, a emotionally moving movie. Yes, it had his superhero tropes and that sort of thing, but there is a spectrum there, but I just think in the genre for you, it's just take it or leave it, that sort of thing. It's yeah. just not, and that's why like, as much as Wild Sun, you know, is, um, tries to lean away from that. So as much as there is action, like I said, it's grounded, intimate action as much as we can tell it. There is sort of a climax, or there's like larger battle scenes. We definitely get into the larger battle, uh, but it's like a pivotal, climactic kind of battle that we've been sort of building up to in two, over two books. So it's not like we're just throwing them in there every other page for the sake of this larger galactic right. struggle, right? Um, I'm gonna I'm going to make this conversation extremely, extremely inappropriate by likening it to nude scenes because I was talking about shirtless men before. Continue. Uh, <laughs> Pour yourself another drink. <laughs> well, I, hey, you're the one that wrote erotica, Shaquille. But for absolutely no good reason, you know, and for, okay, well, why are we having that in this film if it doesn't do something to drive the plot and having other things gratuitously in a book because of, and you mentioned tropes, um, mm. having them there just to have them there. So are we just putting this gigantic space battle in here because it needs to be here? Or is this a pivotal character building moment for the story we're trying to tell? And I'm sure you guys, are like, oh, graphic nudity, what are you talking about? But that idea of, yeah. What was the point of all this graphic nudity in this movie? Did it drive the plot? Was it pivotal for character development or what have you? Right. Um, but often having that in terms of 
yes, this was pivotal for this character's moment. Same thing with, um, and I'm thinking about that ending battle sequence in the first book. And don't spoil me on the second because I haven't read it yet, but yeah. I, I guess I'm not allowed to spoil the first one. I, come on, yeah. everybody's going yeah. right. Yeah. 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 Like, yeah. ask you why you tore my heart out. Let's, and let's, no, there's, let's, there's 50,000 people on the call. You know, they, I don't want to give, give them the opportunity to, to, to read it. Let's but but some yeah. questions here. Oh yeah, yeah. But like, while you look at the, the question, let yeah. me answer that. Let me just see. Uh, say this: what the what writers and filmmakers have done in the hero genre, and Asan and I spoke about this recently on an interview. Was um, what happened with the Joker with Joaquin Phoenix's and Todd Phillips was uh, the director, right? That is now skewing towards right something that I believe is like they're abandoning the Michael Bay version. Well, no, there's still Zack Snyder's um, uh, whatever new movies coming out too. They understand that. But there is a whole world of opportunity for these guys to get into, like I said, some of the, the darker or just other elements of the human psychology. And Joker was a good example of what they could do and make a billion dollar franchise at the same time. But anyway, you had a, there was some questions. I know this is a, by the way, if everyone's listening, they're going to just kick us out in like uh, at, at nine p in yeah. it's, called, it's last call, basically. It's yeah. pretty much last we're call. We're going to come on. We're all going to, we're all going to scatter. Yeah. So the, the upvoted question right now, and then uh, there's one for all. Th the first one is, did your writing process change from wild sun unbound to Wild Two. Yeah. 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 So, so I it. yeah, uh, sure. Yeah. I mean, that one is, I think straightforward. Um, yes. So yes, it did definitely change. Um, the, the process I think, okay, well, you know, yeah. So yes, it did change in wild sun. We were just way more shaky and uncertain around um, the corners. Uh, we're going around corners because we just didn't know. We're like, okay, who are these characters to us? We're still in that, we're still in that definition stage of it. Um, okay. In terms, and we're talking, you know, it's not, it's not a spoiler to say that the story's told from three different perspectives. Yes. So each one of the through lines in each of the stories is that we tell the story from three different perspectives, um, potentially different characters. It's not the same characters throughout, uh, but for the most part, you can pretty much guarantee that Sarin is going to be, you're going to tell the story from her perspective throughout mm -hmm. the trilogy. Um, but re beyond that, yeah, we just, we, we just, we, regardless of the fact that we spent a lot of time scaffolding and structuring the novel in the first one, and even in the second one, by the time we got to the second one, we just were way more comfortable and understood a little bit more about the characters, right? We just went through 90,000 words of these characters. So we're like, okay, um, they were able, they were starting to speak to us and tell us what they would do next, right? Um, like so we were able, we, it was more like following rather than sort of dragging them along and trying to discover them at the same time. Um, so that, that just made it so. Sometimes when they do that. What's that? Isn't that great when they piss you off though? Sometimes when they do that. Oh, I, all the time. Yeah. There's I'm so many times where we're like, yeah, I, I, that's I, like, no, I want you to do this. And it's like, no, you can't. Yeah. And the you, motivations no, don't line up for it. Uh -huh. I, I yeah. one where, like, let's just do this. It sounds like, no, 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 we, it's not how this works. I love, I loved it going into the abstract. Um, side of it, but yeah, it definitely did change in that regard where we were kind of led into it more. There, there, there was just way more momentum. These they, they take on, they take awesome. on. yeah, okay. I yeah. have to ask you guys though, because I'm dealing with the same thing. Maybe I can't talk about this because it might spoil Unbound, but okay. So, wait, can I not say the end of Wild Sun? Because I need to ask you a question, okay? okay. In the second book, we're going to yeah. experience Rick, the Rick, new world, yes, Rick freaking out right now. He's like, no, don't put it, don't put it. I'm really sorry. Um, no, okay, I'm kidding. I'm sorry. What was the question? What was the question? So we're going to experience some new worlds in Unbound. Yes. Right? Yes. 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 So yes. that was where we were. Actually, it's one of the points yes. where we were going back and forth on because we were like, we wanted to keep things grounded. So the way oh. that we tried to do it still <laughs> tried to stay true to like an intimate telling one character's perspective type situation where we didn't just open it up to be this whole large Anyway, right. sorry, continue your question. Okay, so obviously at the end of Asperfell, um, they're out and they're out in the world. And um, my agent said to me, she's like, oh, okay, so you did all this work building this world. Um, 
and now you're going to go build another one like <laughs> and yeah. Yeah. Sequels where it's like oh yes i've already built this like great playground that i can mess around in already and instead i created a headache for myself having to build brand new lore brand new locations brand new traditions and religions and things like that and i'm like oh my god why did i do this because mm -hmm. you know it was that a headache for you too leaving some of what you built and having to take these characters into new worlds and start fresh with the world building was it a stress for you guys as it has been for me i think i think yes uh what? yes it was um because i mean the key thing was to whatever that other world was that we built um we didn't want to we did we, we deliberately said we're not going to make this too big it's going to be like a taste of this other world however everything that they interact with is going to have a tie-in to service the larger plot right so the reason they're there why you know uh what they need to get from there um the the, the sort of cli political climate on that on that other world um was also relevant and yeah i mean that that's really just the that was the key challenge of of, okay. of doing that is just making it so that it was totally relevant to do it and we just didn't want to explode things too big um where it didn't make sense but one of the i mean one of our you know, a question we always get asked is that, like, you know, what what are some of the hardest scenes for you to write, right? And there's a couple of scenes you 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 read book one, um, yes. and so you know it's probably some of the tougher scenes to read. Like, I think you know. It, I'm thinking about that, you guys need to pay me for my therapy, but like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, right? No, alcohol helps. I mean, it's, I think. Can that's you tell me what the hardest scene to write was? Well, so that's what I was kind of alluding to why it ties into this question is that like, um, is that oddly enough, the hardest scenes to write for me are, are for, for, I, I won't answer for Shaquille, but when I look back on them was, uh, writing Sonus and like, basically it oddly was, you know, he's an engineer, he's an engineering yeah. mind, right? So it's like, he's in very drab circumstances where it's really yeah. hard to pull something interesting. What's interesting about this guy tinkering and mining? And like interacting with with um, modules and robots and all these other drones and things like that and repairing things and how to how to make those scenes come out and actually be interesting for a reader was really challenging. Um, yeah. So in book two, we wanted to sort of I won't say spice things up, but we wanted to put him in a different dynamic to see how yeah. he would being with that same sort of mind and sort of character we had created, but put him in a more um, just basically in a totally different dynamic to see how he would react. And that we thought would be that, a compelling yeah. way to, to parse out, you know, his personality, who he really yeah. is to kind of basically take him out of his, not necessarily his comfort, comfort zone, but his established environment, right. Or yeah. established that, you know, that he was, he was used to. Um, so yeah. So in that way, I, I, that, that we did um, find the second, second book easier. Um, all right. Question. Let's go. Next question here. What's next for you two and Jamie? What's next for you? Uh, well, um, I think we've kind of alluded to some of that. Well, I've got a book coming out in the summer. Um, yeah. So I'm doing my revisions right now. Um, it's a challenge. Uh, you know what? I don't think I'd find it nearly as much of a challenge if I wasn't working a pretty tough job in the middle of a pandemic. Um, as I said, I teach. So I teach yeah. over Zoom this whole virtual oh, environment oh, sort of yeah, live. Yeah. Um, but so I am working on that. I, I just, um, Asperfell just made its first um, foreign sales, so it will be translated. Yeah. Into, yeah, for the public. yeah. Um, so um, uh, Harvey Klinger agency over there, Kate and Wendy uh, over in uh, the UK. Uh, so it'll be translated for the first time. And uh, Rick and I were just talking the other day about how weird that is because I don't speak Czech, so I will not be able to read it and be like, yes, this is an accurate. Just, <laughs> yeah. What isn't going to make it over in translation because it's written in a lot yeah, of yeah. Uh, English style. Um, right. But I can't wait for, for that to happen. So that's pretty cool. So um, you guys, that's I guess, funny. probably are drafting book three or are you already actively writing book three at this point? Well, I mean, we can give a, bit, a little bit of a a little bit of a spicy update here. Um, Where are you under the bus? Yeah, wanna... <laughs> yeah, Rick, I mean, he's going to find out too. Uh, if you want to talk about it, Chad? Yeah, yeah, 100%. Uh, 100%. Yeah, yeah. so we, yeah, we're, we're, we're basically venturing off. Uh, we're still on track for book three for any publishers who are in involved in this call. Um, but we are going to um, 
branch off and write a, a bit of a novella and a backstory, uh, which is a, a backstory to one of our key characters in Wild Sun Book One. Uh, so think about much, you know, something much more condensed um, and sort of finely tuned. Well, and tell toned. me who it is. Uh, no. no, I don't think you can. Yeah, I don't no. think you can. No. <laughs> uh, because we're exploring yeah, these, have with us. I have to know. We're, we're yeah, also we're exploring, no. um, uh, interestingly, it's, it's, it's going to be non-traditional. Uh, I don't even know how to get into it, but I don't think we will, honestly. But yeah, we're exploring something that's very condensed, but um, very non-traditional in terms of the potential format for it. So it's kind of cool. We're, we're kind of excited based on you know, Wild Sun would look cool as is a graphic novel. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, we've we've definitely Not toyed sure. around with that. Yeah, like, something yeah. like that. I yeah, I yeah, I I love the rise of graphic novels lately. I love that it is getting mm -hmm. so many more, especially as a teacher. I see there's so many more kids to dive into. Mm -hmm. And, and it's so the, um, yeah, Shaquille okay. mentioned the hero's journey because um, that's what I teach to my sixth graders. So they learn it through. Yeah. Percy Jackson. yeah. Um, shout out Rick Riordan. Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> And so I get to teach all these archetypes and, and tropes um, through this wonderful medium. And so um, I was just thinking the other day, I'm like, did I intend to write Asper Phil as a bit of a hero's journey? Absolutely not. Did it end up that way? Does the mono myth just kind of sneak yeah. into yeah. our writing? Yeah. And certainly, yes, I think it maybe does when we're looking at these these origins here. But, why, um, why, why? The question always is, is like, why does this persist? Like, why? why? <laughs> And I have studied this, obviously. Yeah. Uh, I yeah. teach mythology as well. Um, oh, okay. Oh, then you know, so like, well, we all teach an elective at school, and so all these electives are like STEM and um, music and all these things, and you think that that's what I would teach, art, all that. And I'm like, I want to teach mythology. And they're like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like middle school mythology, but I do. And, um, oh, God, the kids love it. I mean, because this oh, is yeah. – the historical Spider-Man. I mean, it is exactly the, the precursor to all of the great hero, hero's journeys for sure. And oh my goodness, mythology is salacious. So yeah, much, so much inappropriate content. Um, but just that hero's journey, that monomyth, looking at why it persists and why uh, and how we, we apply it to our own lives too. When you look at Joseph Campbell's um, spirituality and his idea mm -hmm. of that rebirth, and um, and so just. Thinking about that, and you brought it up, and it's so great because now I'm looking at Wild Sun. Like, I can tell you who I'd like you guys to write that novella about. But, you know. Ah, interesting. Yeah. Saying, oh. Do we have any more questions? We have a minute left. Are they oh, going to really? okay. Yeah, yeah. So, oh, okay. That was amazing. About? Yeah, yeah. I think. Yes. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah. I think uh, I think they, it, uh, it's fifty-seven minute runtime, so they. I, write it. I won't kick you guys out if you want to answer one more question. What? Oh wow! Oh, oh, who is that? Yeah, oh, the mysterious. voice of mysterious Callie. <laughs> yeah, I know. She did make it. She did make it clear we have to answer a question. So, uh, so uh, uh, next okay. one is. Uh, what about Brian? Brian's question here. Yeah, go for it, uh, son. Go ahead, read it. For for everyone, do you feel it's challenging to write characters so different from you in various characteristics? gender, background, culture, race, religion, with a strong amount of realism, and how about those things affect who they are? Wow. Brian, thank God we only have one minute to answer that because I know. Uh, it's like, that's an amazing question. Uh, we totally slept yeah. on that one. Um, uh, uh, well, you guys are from a female perspective. Um, yeah. a bit. That's a pretty obvious one. In that yeah. regard, obviously, you threw things on its head in terms of the traditional story about a a, a man saving a woman, right? Whereby you're a, you 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 turn that uh, upside down uh, as well. So we definitely played with some things. Now, again, we uh, we're not going to be able to answer this very quickly, but um, I, I think adversity uh, and the human spirit, uh, ir, you know, irrespective of uh, any of our labels, I find that there's some commonality to to the to that experience and that we're all yearning uh, for something greater. And there's certain things that's obviously based on uh, uh, biology that put us in these shapes and these forms. But outside of that, I, I do believe we are, we are more uh, a singular thing than we are not. I don't know if that is anything, but go ahead. Yeah. Okay, you oh, Brian, you're well informed there. Right. He knows exactly what you meant. <laughs> Brian's like, oh, I got it. I got exactly what you, what you were going at. Um, it was really important for me um, not to write. I, I really wanted to write a, a strong 
female character who was not a man with boobs. Um, that was really important to me that um, because a, an ordinary woman like like myself, who I consider strong, um, don't give me a sword, like I'll cut my own face off. Uh, yeah. But um, things like compassion and mm -hmm. uh, you know, courage and intelligence and kindness and things like that that we see as inherently feminine and yet are not strong. And that really bothered me because those those are strengths um, and necessary strengths. And so I, I really wanted in Bryony to be a character who um, you're not gonna see wielding a big sword in battle. Um, you know, her, her strength comes from uh, a different place. And I, it was really important to me that I not vilify uh, femininity. Bryony isn't necessarily completely feminine, but she's also not masculine in that in that sense. And her strength mm. comes from traits that we often disparage mm. as too feminine. And we often see mm. that with our, our, our political figures or our CEOs or our women in power where we dress as men. Uh, consider the pantsuit, you know, um, where we dress as men to disguise our femininity because if we are seen as too feminine, we'll be seen as weak. And, um, you know, a woman should not have to disguise herself as a man to be seen as strong. Um, so that was definitely something that um, I've drawn from in my personal life. Oh, it's so lovely to um, be girly and cheerful and to meet a man in power and to have him say later, oh, gosh, you're a lot smarter than I thought you'd be. Um, because you came on as cheerful and smart and, and, and girly and all that. And they're shocked to discover you have multiple degrees and have authored, you know, you know, papers. And it's like, seriously, I don't want to have to dress myself up as a man for you to see my femininity as strength. So that I'm sure I just went over our time with that, but I just had to get that. <laughs> oh, great. That was, that was an awesome answer. Yeah. That was an awesome answer. Cool. All right. And Clemson, right. we'll throw it back to you. I know we, we ran over a little bit. Sorry. It was oh, no. That was totally worth it. Are you kidding me? The amount of times you'd be so pretty if you smiled. Or why don't you smile? I'm like. And then when you do smile, it's like, oh, you're so cute. You can't possibly be confident or smart or intelligent. Like, yeah. as, as, as one of the men in this uh, chat, let me tell you how you guys are feeling about the topic. Uh, <laughs> Please, man, explain. Uh, yeah. explain. <laughs> you can imagine how much I get from male, like, let me explain how fantasy works. I'm like, oh, let me see your publisher. Uh, exactly. exactly. <laughs> And it's a whole other conversation yes. about how all the fantasy authors I grew up reading wrote under guys' names they so that they to. could actually be published. Oh, and there are oh, huge wow. authors in the genre. And yeah. then I'm like older and I was like, wait, I, I only liked female authors, but I thought they were all guys. What? That is like a whole other TED talk long thing we have. <laughs> but um, I do have to be the bad guy. Cue I my know. bad guy music. Cause it is, it is at the hour mark. It is such a pleasure listening to you guys. So I feel like I've just gotten to like hang out and talk to like a group of really awesome people who are friends, which is like, you can't ask for anything better. So. It's so fun. Yeah. It's, yeah, been, it's been it's been an absolute joy, and also too like fun, but also very informative and also thought provoking, which you don't always get. That is a very unique <laughs> and amazing combination. Really it really did. <laughs> yeah, it was awesome. So I want to give a huge, huge, huge thank you to Jamie, Asan, and Shaquille. Thank you so very much for joining us. Thank you so much to our audience for your enthusiasm and amazing questions. I don't want to end this event because I feel like we could talk for another hour. But I know you guys are on the East Coast, it sounds like. So you are probably You guys are. Looking. I'm in Washington State. It's uh. It's <laughs> clock for me here, so. I'm giving us a good out. Don't ruin the out I'm giving us. <laughs> <laughs> but it is that time to end. And thank you all so very much for joining us. Please go support these amazing humans and authors and buy their book down below. And we will see you all at the next event. Have a good evening, Great. everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>